Well, hello and welcome to the 5 p.m. service at St. Andrew the Great Church, or the live stream at least. My name is Craig. I'm one of the staff members here, and I'll be uh, taking us through the first part of our service before my colleague Vic takes over. We've got some great things in store this evening. We're going to hear God's Word, the Bible, read to us and then preached to us. Uh, we're going to sing some songs together and some other things as well. So do stay tuned. It will take just uh, under an hour, and there'll be lots of other things that we can uh, be doing in the coming days and weeks as well the end we'll advertise those. Well it may be that you are uh, new to the live stream, uh, maybe you've come along to a Real Lives Real Hope event. If you haven't caught one of those already then do look on the YouTube page of the church and check those out because some of them have been brilliant and they are well worth a watch. In our service this morning, it would be really useful if you have a Bible to hand. Um, but don't worry if you don't have a Bible or if you've never read the Bible before. All the words will come up on the screen and everything in our service will be accessible to everyone, whether they've been to a church all their life or this is the first time you've come to something like this. We're going to begin our time by singing a song together and it's a song which introduces some of the themes we'll be hearing more about in our Bible passage that in Jesus we find everything that we could need and he is the only place that we can find those things in his name. My name's Vic and I work alongside Craig with the 20s and 30s. 
It seems strange to think about it now, but do you remember just a few weeks ago, we really needed pasta and flour and loo roll, and it was just so hard to find them. One of the things I love about prayer is that we bring our needs to God and he is merciful and powerful. And as we bring our needs to him, we know that he will provide for us. We're going to spend some time in prayer now and we're going to be led in that by Rachel Wadsley. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Wadsley, I'm married to Simon and we have a son Joshua. And we are so looking forward to being able to meet with you all again soon we hope. As Vic said, I'm going to lead us in praying to our Heavenly Father. And amongst other things, we're going to be praying for Kathleen Spence, one of our mission partners with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Nigeria. Kathleen came back a few months ago for home assignment and was due to return to Nigeria at the end of March, but hasn't been able to because of the current circumstances. Well, if you've been with us over these past few weeks, as we've been looking at Philippians, you will have heard God's exhortation to us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, not to be fearful of those who oppose us, to look to the interests of others, to have the attitude of Jesus Christ, not to complain or argue, to rejoice in the Lord. And if you're anything like me, you'll have failed to live like that this past week. So what a relief to know that we can come to our Heavenly Father, confess our sins and receive his forgiveness. So let's confess our sins to him now using the words on the service sheet or on the screen. Together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, We acknowledge and confess the grievous sins and wickedness which we have so often committed in thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your anger and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time onwards we may always serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this reassurance for us from 1 Peter. He, Jesus, himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Let's continue in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing a way for us to be forgiven, a way that we can come back to you. We praise you that you were willing to do this at great cost to yourself the cost of your son. Thank you that he humbled himself even to death on a cross. Please would we have more and more joy each day in Jesus and what he's done for us. And please help us to remember this week that Jesus bore our sins that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. That you have exalted him to the highest place and he is Lord over all. So may we keep choosing not to follow our own selfish ambition, not to grumble, not to argue, but rather to live as Jesus lived, looking to the interests of others. And we pray that as we live this way, we'll shine like stars in the places you've put us and have opportunities to tell others of Jesus so that they too can share the joy of sins forgiven and of knowing you. And we ask that the Real Lives Real Hope interviews on Monday evenings would be a help to us in doing this. Father, we pray for our dear sister, Kathleen Spence. Thank you for using hardships in the past to give her a heart willing to let go of her plans and to trust in yours. Help her now to keep waiting patiently for the time she can go back to Nigeria. Thank you that she can keep in touch with others involved in translating the Bible in Nigeria so that this vital work can continue. 
We pray for translators and communities in remote locations there to keep working out their salvation, knowing that you are at work in them. Would you provide for them in lockdown, both physically with a good harvest and rains and spiritually, when many don't have your word in their own language, nor access to internet church services? We pray for those who live in parts of Nigeria where the security issues are more of a concern than COVID. The Bible translation staff who've been pulled out for that reason. May they trust that you are Lord, you hear their cries for help, you care, and you will work out your purposes. Father, we pray for our own country, for the Queen and her government faced with unprecedented challenges at this time. May they seek wisdom from you and make decisions that serve the people of this country. We thank you for the authority structures that we have in this country, for the emergency services and the ease with which we can get food compared to other parts of the world. We pray that these challenges would cause people to seek you and find you. And we pray for the leaders of our church family, thinking how to pastor us through this time and making decisions for the future when everything is uncertain. Please give them wisdom and help them remember they serve under Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who knows each of his sheep by name. And so we end with today's collect. Lord God, the unfailing helper and guide of those whom you bring up in your unmovable fear and love. Keep us, we pray, under the protection of your good providence and give us a continual reverence and love for your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we've looked at the book of Philippians in our sermon series over the last few weeks, we've seen the Apostle Paul rejoicing even though he's in prison. We've seen the costly hard work of Timothy and Epaphroditus as they poured themselves out for the sake of the gospel. And I guess you might have either thought, gosh, I could never do that, or yeah, I'd, I'd back myself to be quite like them. Well, whichever one we are, this next song is for us. It reminds us that those things are possible and they're only possible because Christ is working through us.
I've got a few things to tell you about now that are happening in church life over the next few weeks. The first is that lots of you will know that over the last few Monday nights, we've been hosting a series of events in our Real Lives Real Hope series. Our next one is a week on Monday. So this week might be a chance for you to take some time to check out the STAG website. If you go to stag.org forward slash mission 2020, you'll find some great resources there to help you to reach out to your friends with the good news of Jesus. Two newish resources, which you might not have seen before, are a three-part mini-series where I got to catch up with a few people in the church family who've been reading the Bible with their friends. And they've got so many top tips um, to share with us about something some of us might find a bit intimidating. Um, So do head over there and check that out. The other thing is a little video by the evangelist Roger Carswell, in which he talks about all the opportunities he's had, even in lockdown, to share God's word with people. Um, I found it a really inspiring watch. It's well worth three minutes of your time. Another thing that's happening straight after this service is after church coffee, where we gather as a church family. We're having a bit of a relaunch of it today. So instead of just heading off into separate groups, we're all going to meet together on one Zoom call um, so we can um, really enjoy some time together as a church family. If you enjoyed um, that at the church prayer meeting this month, then you'll really like this. Um, But we're then also going to split off into smaller groups so we can really get to know each other. The way to access that is either to go to the normal website afterchurchcoffee.com or to go to stag.org slash afterchurchcoffee and they'll both direct you to the same place. If you're new, we'd love to welcome you to join us um, so we can say hi to you. And uh, we hope to see loads of you there after this service. The last thing to mention is that sadly, it's the time of year where we have to say goodbye to people. Um, We are gonna say goodbye today to Rob and Helen Lowe with Emily and Harriet. They're off to Australia. This is their last Sunday with us. So do be praying for them as they head off on that long journey. If you're going to be leaving Cambridge this summer, we'd love to be able to say a proper goodbye to you as well. So do let us know when your last Sunday is going to be. 
And finally, there's a big um, group of people who are leaving Cambridge at this time, and that is the students who are graduating. Um, we, it's been a real joy to have you with us. Um, we've really enjoyed it. You've been a great blessing to us. Um, and we're sad that you can't say goodbye to us in person, but here is the next best thing. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah and I studied Education, Policy and International Development at Keyes College. Next year I'm going to be doing something called the Care Leadership Programme, which involves four days a week at my placement in the House of Lords, working as an intern for Baroness Finlay, and then one day a week at Care, having lectures on political theology and training in leadership skills. So I'm really excited for next year, but I'm really going to miss Stag. I'm so thankful for all the student workers who took the time out to read the Bible with me in my first year which really helped me to grow in my faith and also gave me the confidence to do the same for those younger than me. Hi, I'm Becca. I'm a manufacturing engineer in my fourth year, so I'm graduating this year. I've been really thankful um, this year about God's provision for all church friends and course mates that have made this year so fun. Um, and next year, at the moment, I don't know what I'm doing, so I, I have literally no plans. But yeah, I'm also very thankful for these chickens as well. Thanks. Hello, I'm Peter. I'm one of the graduating students at STAG. I've spent the last three years studying history at Trinity Hall. Next year, I'm going to be working as a teaching assistant at Moncton Coon School just outside Bar, which is very exciting. You've asked me to think of one thing that I'm thankful for about the last three years at STAG. Uh, in reality, there's many things I'm thankful for, but I think the main one probably is the friendship and the fellowship I've been able to enjoy, which has meant so much being away from home. Um, I felt it um, from the time that I was welcomed here, uh, all the way through to now with the support I've been able to receive. So that's the main thing that I'm thankful for. I'm Emma and I studied Modern and Medieval Languages at Clare College. I'll be sticking around in Cambridge next year as a ministry intern at STAG and I'm really looking forward to learning lots and serving this church which has loved and served me so well over the past four years. I think one big highlight of Cambridge for me has been the friendships, friends who've laughed with me, cried with me, prayed for me um, and consistently encouraged me and challenged me to live more like Jesus in my daily life. I'm really thankful for them and I know we'll stay friends long after graduation. Love you guys! Hi! Hi! Well, it was great to hear from the students and I'm going to hand over to one of them now, T, and he is going to read the passage to us from Philippians. Hi, I'm T. And I'm a graduating chemical engineering student who studied at Homerton College while I was in Cambridge. It has been bittersweet to have ended my time in Cambridge so abruptly, but I'm grateful that I've been able to stay in touch with my friends from uni and from church, even though it's not as good as being in the same city. At the moment, I'm in my hometown of Preston with my family. And now that I've finished my exams, I've been able to get creative with some music collaborations, which is something that I've missed from being in Cambridge. In a second, I'm going to read from Philippians 3, from verse 7 to 16. But first, let us pray. Father Lord, we praise you that your word is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray that as we hear your word taught and preached this evening, that it will truly cut deep to our minds and hearts. In your name, Amen. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, 
but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome. Let me add my welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you. Please keep open that passage in Philippians chapter 3. We'll look at it together. But first, I've got a question. We're thinking about joy. We saw a bit last week. The letter to the Philippians is full of joy. And here's my question. What is it that gives you joy? What's that thing that, that takes you from kind of zero miles an hour to 100 miles an hour? Or perhaps to put it another way, what's the one thing that if it was taken from you would rob you of joy? Perhaps you can think of a person, a friend or a fiance or family member. Perhaps you can think of possessions that you have, your home, your health, your mind. Perhaps it's an achievement place at Cambridge University, the job that you have, the retirement plans. What is it that you value most in life? The letter to the Philippians is full of joy, not the kind of sickly Ned Flanders kind of joy. You know, the Christian life is all cheesy grins. Paul knew that writing from prison, that's not what the Christian life was like. The Philippians knew that. They would face suffering and, and persecution for their faith. I'm sure actually many of us realise that the Christian life is not all highs and grins. It's not that kind of joy. But if you just glance back to the verse we had last week, 3 verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord. It is joy in Christ. To be a Christian is to value him above all things. So much so that even if everything is lost, you can still rejoice in him. Jesus Christ is enough, Paul says. He's all I need and he will keep us going to the end. That's the attitude that is commended to us in this little section of the letter, verse 7 to 11. We're not going to have time to look um, at verse, up to verse 16, but we'll come on to that next week. Ten times, just in these few verses... Christ is mentioned by name. Rejoice in him. It'll be a safeguard to you, as we saw last week. And, and it might feel a bit over the top, all this emphasis on Jesus Christ. But if you're joining us and you're not a Christian, this is what Christianity is all about. It's not a set of kind of beliefs or moral values or a kind of code of conduct that we try and live up to. It's not even a gathering on a Sunday. Christianity is all about Jesus. He's right at the heart of it. And Christians like Paul value Christ above all things. We'll see that as we look at verse seven and eight. Value Christ above all things. How does that work? What does that mean? Have a look at verse seven. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. We're kind of jumping midway through a bit of a paragraph. Paul's been warning against the temptation to put confidence in the flesh. It's a funny phrase that comes up in verse 2. What he means is placing confidence in things that make us feel acceptable or accepted before God, trusting in our own human achievement or religious performance. We saw this last week. It seems there's a group in the church in Philippi, or at least they've heard about their teaching, who are saying, you know, Jesus isn't quite enough, actually. To be a good Christian, you basically need a few extra things. You need to become Jewish. And Paul hates this. Now, don't get me wrong, he, he doesn't hate Jews. He is himself a Jewish person. But he describes these people, this, these kind of, these, this halfway house between Christianity and Jewish religion as dogs, mutilators of the flesh. He's so strong on it. Look, he says, take it from me. If anyone had reason to put confidence in the flesh, like these guys are saying, it was me. We saw this last week. He produces a bit of a spiritual CV, verse 4 to 6. I've actually got my, um, my CV here. 
Now, you guys are probably very familiar with this. Many of you actually may be looking for jobs now, graduating students and things, sending off their CVs for job applications starting in September or whatever. And on a CV, you sell yourself, don't you? It's all about trying to show that you're the best candidate, that you've got the goods, the experience, the qualifications for the job. And when it comes to being Jewish, Paul had the goods. His spiritual CV is ram-packed with stuff that would have made any first century Jewish person dewy-eyed. If anyone was going to be acceptable before God, it was him. But look where he lands, verse 7. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. My spiritual CV, worthless. Absolutely worthless. What makes the difference for Paul? It is Jesus Christ. When Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, that's the thing that makes his CV worthless. All things I consider lost now for the sake of Christ. Now, I don't know what kind of things would be on your spiritual CV. Sorry to be personal, but mine wouldn't have circumcision on it. But we can fall for this kind of confidence in the flesh attitude, can't we? I'm confident in the fact that I'm a Bible study leader, or I'm the kind of person that goes to church, or I'm the kind of person that goes to stag, I've got my right doctrine or whatever. Or I'm confident in the fact that I'm volunteering and I'm, I'm a ministry in ministry or something like that. Maybe it's not explicitly religious things. It's just, you know, being moral, being a nice person. I give money to charity. I've never said anything racist. I'd, I'd be acceptable before God, wouldn't I? But Paul says, Compared to Jesus Christ, those things that got onto his spiritual CV, they are now worth nothing. He goes on, verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Everything. There's lots of accounting language in this passage. Now, I'm sure some of you know a bit more about this than me, but I do know that when it comes to financial reports and totaling stuff up and things like that, you think in terms of profit and loss. So imagine, you know, two columns on a spreadsheet, the profit column, all the things that are gained, and the loss column. And naturally, as humans, we want to fill the profit column with as much as we can. It, it's human nature. So it could be some of that stuff we've talked about if we're religious, you know, our spiritual CV. But it could be heaps of other things too. You know, I want to put the person in there, the friend, the fiance, the family. Our possessions, our home, our health, our mind. It, it could be our achievements that we want to stack up in that profit column. The place at Cambridge, the job, the retirement plan. It's why the kind of Christianized version of that, this confidence in the flesh attitude that Paul is talking about is so plausible. Because it's the way the world around us works. You may not even believe in God, but I bet you're trying to fill up that profit column, grasping after things to give your life value and meaning, to be acceptable to whatever God it is that you worship. Pretty much everything in the world works like this. The workplace, the mosque, the NCT group, the group of friends at school, the university, the gym. But Paul says, if you have Christ, then everything else is loss. Look at verse 8. Again, the end. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Literally kitchen scraps or, or excrement, dung. Now, he's not saying that these things are worthless in and of themselves. You know, a, a job or a family or health or whatever. These are good gifts from God to be enjoyed. But he's just saying compared to gaining Christ, they pale into significance. For Paul, there is nothing else than Jesus that can go in that profit column. He values Christ above everything else. And just think of the implications of that. It means that whenever he is called to choose between anything in this world and Christ, he chooses Christ every time. It means as he interacts with the things of this world, he's able to hold them lightly, to enjoy them, but then also sometimes to let them go. It means that even if he loses any or all of the things that this world can offer, he doesn't lose his joy, his treasure or his life because Christ is enough for him. And actually he does lose so much, doesn't he? For whose sake I have lost all things. He's stuck in a prison. When we know the value of Christ, 
it changes everything. But why? Sounds a little bit abstract. What is it that is actually so good about Jesus that means that Paul can say this? Well, there's heaps of stuff. I mean, you could just say it's because he knows him. That language is, is relational. He has a living relationship with the God of the universe. But there's two particular things that Paul digs down into. He knows that Christ is so valuable because in him is righteousness and in him is resurrection life. Have a look at verse 8. In him is righteousness. End of verse 8. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. This is the Christian gospel in a nutshell. Righteousness by faith. But what does that mean? Those are words we don't always use. Righteous. Well, it's a moral term. In the Bible, it's used in a few different ways. It's used to describe God. God himself is righteous. It means that he is absolutely pure and right. He always does what is good and what is just. And as humans made in the image of God, righteousness is the quality that people need to be acceptable before him. It's, if you like, his standard for humanity, being in the right with God. So just come back with me to that CV metaphor. What does a CV do? Well, if you have the right kind of CV, it, it opens doors, doesn't it? Your CV is a way of saying, look, look at this, please accept me in the job. Um, please, please look at my CV and make a judgment about me. Um, and the people who do that, the employers or whatever, they think, is this person right for the job or not? And being righteous, I guess it's kind of like having the CV that opens up a door to relationship with God. And those things that we cram onto our spiritual CV to try and make it look impressive, the reason they don't work, though, is because there's some stuff on there already that does not read so well. Elsewhere in the Bible, Paul writes, there is no one righteous, not even one. God's standard is perfect righteousness, and human beings fall far, far short. It doesn't matter what we've accumulated, whether it's the religious stuff or the non-religious stuff. Anything else that we put on that CV is just papering over the cracks, trying to mask what we are really like. And when it comes to getting right with God, if our confidence is in any of those things, it is guaranteed bankruptcy. But Paul Luke says, verse 9, that he does not have a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, as in that comes from keeping the Jewish law, but one which is through faith in Christ. For those in Christ, we are made righteous, given the righteousness of another. The Christian CV has two words on it, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' death on the cross, all our unrighteousness, our sin, is, is wiped off. Every evil thought, every bitter deed, every selfish ambition and vain conceit. We're made acceptable before God. But more than that, his perfect life becomes ours. It's as if our CV is instead filled with the righteous thoughts and words and ambitions of another, of Jesus. That's what it means when Paul says, found in him. It's the wonderful reality that Christians are made righteous before God as they are united to Christ by faith. Union with Christ, how does this work? Or to switch up the metaphors a little bit, it's like a marriage. When I got married to my wife, Evie, we said kind of before the rest of the congregation and the vicar and stuff, kind of everything that I have is yours. That means that I got a really beautiful collection of kind of books from Evie's English degree and a car, and she got my student debt. And it's kind of like that with Christ. In union with Christ, Jesus takes all my muck and mess, the sin and the unrighteousness. He nails it to the cross. And in him, I get his perfect life, a righteousness that is not my own. And I don't need to do anything to get this, but trust him 
It is, as Paul says, a righteousness which comes through faith in Christ from God on the basis of faith. It is a free gift. If you're a Christian, God looks at you and sees perfect righteousness. And if you're not a Christian this evening, you're only one prayer away. All you need to do is ask. This, by the way, is the nail in the coffin for those confidence in the flesh guys from earlier in chapter three. Rejoice in this, Paul says, and it will safeguard you from their teaching. The ultimate safeguard against the kind of DIY religion that creeps so easily in. And, and you'll know what that feels like if you've been a Christian for more than a few days, because you know that feeling of oscillating between pride and despair. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm nailing this Christian stuff. At other times, man, I am such a failure. The problem with the confidence in the flesh stuff is that when you've got it, great. When you haven't, it is a disaster. But if you know Christ and the righteousness that comes by faith, well, there is a joy that pierces through those ups and downs. I am accepted, not based on whether I've had my quiet time this morning or read the Bible, not based on what I've done, but because of the righteousness of another. So what is so good about knowing Christ? How can Paul say that Christ is more valuable than anything else? It's because he knows that in him is righteousness. Secondly, in him is resurrection life, verse 10 and 11. Well, this is another thing that it means to gain him, to know the power of his resurrection. Look at verse 10. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the ultimate prize to be made like Jesus forever in the new creation, attaining, verse 11, somehow, to the resurrection from the dead. When he says somehow there, I don't think he means, it, he's not certain that it's gonna happen, he just doesn't quite know when it's going to happen. But that prize is more precious than you could possibly imagine, and we'll spend more time thinking about it next week. Resurrection power, the ultimate prize, that sounds great, doesn't it? But hold on because this comes with a bit of a health warning. It's still great, but look at the second half of verse 10. I want to know Christ, he says. It's funny, isn't it? He's known him for 30 years, but still he wants to press on and know him more. How? By knowing the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. I think what he means is that he wants to know and experience the suffering that Christ himself experience, to become like Jesus in that path, that shape. We said it already in chapter two, the shape of the Christian life, because it's the shape that Jesus took, suffering now and then glory. Jesus stooped low, became humble, obedient to death, and then was raised up. And I just wonder if we're struggling with the idea that Jesus Christ is more valuable than anything else, if we're not able really to come up with a, a great answer to that question, what is it that makes Jesus so valuable? Maybe, just maybe it's because we've not fully embraced the second half of verse 10. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Do you know that this is the shape of the Christian life? Because when you know Christ in and through suffering, when you follow that trajectory of cross and resurrection, that is when you really see that Jesus is enough. When you really know his value. It's a bit of a cliche, but maybe it's true. You don't realize Jesus is all you need until he is all that you have. In his book, um, Ordinary Hero, the writer Tim Chester talks about a, um, a Pakistani man called Rashid who turns to Christ. Um, he became a Christian. But as he did that, he was rejected by his family and his wife was forced to leave him. And, and he writes this, this man Rashid. Some might conclude that my life is pitiable. After all, every evening after I finish my shift, I go home to an empty flat, one not filled with the gleeful shouts of a six-year-old 
when I go to bed at night, there is no one beside me to say, I love you. I expect never to hear from my parents on my birthday or on any other day for that matter. The only noise in my home comes from the television set and that I do not watch very often. But to pity me would be to miss the joy I have experienced. I believe things are better now than they were before I was a Christian. My house might be quiet, but I am not lonely. My family may have forsaken me, but I am not abandoned. I have Christ and that is enough. Indeed, it is more than enough. In my eyes, I have been blessed beyond measure, far greater than I deserve and more than I could have hoped. It's an extreme example, but what are the little ways in which we are called now to suffer for Christ? Maybe it's self-denial and service of others. We were thinking about that a lot in chapter two. Maybe it's the suffering of giving up something that we know that Jesus says is not gonna do us good. Later on in the book, Tim Chester writes, I believe you'll actually discover more of the worth of Christ and the joy of serving him, the more you risk for him and the more you give for him and the more you lose for him. Do we know the value of Christ? Too often maybe, we don't see that treasure because we're unwilling to suffer loss when it comes to the things of the world. But Christ is more valuable than anything we could imagine. He is more valuable than everything this world affords. Do we know how valuable he is? Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for the example of Paul. And we thank you that he considered all things lost compared to the surpassing value and gain of knowing Christ. And we pray that we too would be like that. Fix in our minds, our Father, the value of your Son and help us to live for him, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours by faith and following him to resurrection life through suffering. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but after hearing a sermon like that, I want to sing about it. I want to sing these truths to myself as I, uh, I suppose, respond to all that I've heard. Uh, maybe you'd like to do that too. And our next song is a prayer, I suppose, a prayer that what we've just heard from God's word would be our vision for this coming week and for the rest of our life. It might be that you don't feel ready to sing these words yet, um, but just listen to them um, because this is what it means to be a Christian, that God's vision would be our vision for now and forevermore.
Well, that brings us to the end of our service, but there's lots of other things that we can be doing uh, together today if we'd like to. Uh, there's uh, After Church Coffee, uh, the link of which should be on your screens right now. If you go to that link or type it into your browser, uh, that'll take you to a new kind of virtual hangout that we've set up. Um, it's a Zoom call where we'll all be together and then we can have breakout rooms from there. So it should have all the brilliant things that we've had uh, all this year uh, as we've been online, uh, but hopefully even better than before. So do make use of that if you'd like to. Uh, as ever, all of the, uh, the Real Lives uh, Real Hope events are still on the website, so you can see those. Uh, they are fantastic, so do make use of those if you haven't seen them already. Um, and upcoming this week, there will be small groups uh, and things like that. Maybe if you're a guest to the church, um, but you think you'd like to get a little bit more involved, just send the church an email um, and we would love to uh, put you in touch with some like-minded people that you can meet and get to know. Well, that's the end of our service now. I'm gonna pray for us and then we can head into after church coffee if we'd like to. Let me pray. Father, we confess that deep down we know um, that all things in this world, good though they are, um, are temporary. They don't ultimately satisfy, but we thank you that in your son, uh, we can find eternal satisfaction. Help us to live lives for him now uh, that compared to him, all things might pale into insignificance, um, that we might live wholeheartedly for him in the knowledge that this is life lived to the full now and forevermore. Amen. He did his PhD at Cambridge University. He's principal of Tyndale House. He's a member of a Bible translation committee and is the associate editor of the Greek New Testament produced at Tyndale House. And all that is to say, he is more than qualified to speak about the reliability of the Bible. Well, I'm a Christian, therefore I think that the Bible is God's word to us, but also it's old and it's something we can investigate. It's not just all about our feelings. Actually, there's a ton of historical material, thousands and thousands of pages of manuscripts to look through, archaeology, all sorts of things. The translations are made from the earliest copies uh, available to us. And you can actually check, I mean, so many manuscripts are available. You can actually look at the images, the earliest complete manuscript of the New Testament, Codex Sinaiticus, because it's all up online. Every word transcribed and also translated into English. So you can actually check any of that. I've got the earliest copy of the Ten Commandments in Cambridge in the University Library. There are places you can go and check things. And so people sit in this armchair way as if you can't go out and find information about this sort of thing. You can, there's loads of it, a lifetime worth. In the academic study of the Bible, there are plenty of people who don't take as positive a view of the Bible as I have. And in my 20, five or so years of academic study of the Bible, a bit more than that. I've had to engage with all of their arguments fully. I, I went through a period of doubt in my early 20s when it wasn't making sense to me, uh, and I very seriously looked at the alternatives. But I, I think that at the end of the day, Jesus is the Son of God coming to the world to save us made the most sense. And I can also say that in some tiny areas, I've got to know more about the Bible than anyone else on the planet. I gave my very tiny specialist areas and it really fits. I want to apply it to myself, um, and, but I also want to study it analytically. I think that's a, a good thing, good stewardship for, for me to do.